as time proceeds forth, the gap for selecting which camera you should purchase continues to grow thinner and thinner. The single most asked question by anyone who traverses these pathways is which camera should they choose? We are getting closer to the answer. Both of these cameras were announced six months and one day apart, are within a $400 spread, and are pro grade. Now it's up to us to find out which one is right for you. The Sony ZV-E1 or the FX30. I've owned the FX30 for six months and have used it in real world situations on both professional work and as my main B cam for all of my videos. Thanks to Lens Rentals, I rented the ZV-E1 to see if it would be worth purchasing as a cheaper full-frame B-cam to my A7S III and also to make this video. By the way, this video is not sponsored by Lens Rentals, but if you are kind of on the fence about buying a new camera like the FX30 or the ZV-E1 or some other piece of camera gear, rent it from Lens Rentals like I do. I always try out this stuff before I make a big purchase decision and I can tell you it saved me so much time and many headaches, especially if I end up not liking it and having to sell it on the used market. I have a 15% off discount code and I'll leave it in the description so that you can save a little bit of money and it'll make me a small commission. Most of us can only choose one camera. The lenses I've used for these video tests with both of these cameras are the 85mm f1.4 G Master, the 35mm f1.4 Zeiss, and a Tamron 17-28 f2.8 for some of those wider shots. If you've been in the market for a new Sony camera, then you know that there's a lot of options available. When someone asks me which camera is better, I always turn the question back to that person by saying, which camera is better for you and your situation? To get to that answer, let's walk down this path together and we will explore the specs, look at the similarities and differences, and most importantly, talk about the image quality. This way, you have all the information you need to make an informed decision. To start off, we know who these cameras are marketed towards. The ZV-E1 is more for content creators and vloggers, and the FX30 is more for small-scale video production and social media videos, according to Sony's website. But ultimately, I would say both of these cameras are for aspiring professionals. YouTubers are more inclined to pick up the ZV-E1 because it's easy to pick up and start using and has a ton of auto modes like product showcase mode and some AI functionality while filmmakers would be more inclined to pick up the FX30 because it has five quarter mount mounting points for accessories and two SD card slots and the new firmware update that provides 4K DCI and anamorphic D-squeeze. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the differences, let's talk about the similarities. Both cameras are Sony E-mount. They both have a three inch articulating screen, use the same batteries, have electronic shutter, can shoot in 422 10-bit, have zoom rockers, mic ports, headphone jacks, and HDMI out. USB-C, Wi-Fi, both collect gyro data for Catalyst Browse and have intelligent hot shoes. They have the same menu system, both have lens breathing compensation, both can connect to Sony's new creators app, and both can import LUTs. And as you probably already know, the ZV-E1 is full frame and the FX30 is APS. If you're confused about what the difference is between those, I made an entire video where I compared full frame to APS-C and I'll leave that video in the description. The shortened version is that full frame will be better for dynamic range and low light shots and APS-C will have cheaper lens options that will crop in at 1.5 times the full frame equivalent. Sensor size by no means means that one camera is more professional than the other. Sensor size has nothing to do with it. Most of the big box office Hollywood movies are shot on a Super 35 APS-C Airy camera. With that said, what's more important to me is dynamic range, frame rate, resolution, usability, and ultimately the image quality. The ZV-E1 is advertised to have 15 stops of dynamic range, whereas the FX30 is advertised to have 14 stops. And the ZV-E1 can shoot in 4K up to 60 frames per second, 
which will change when Sony releases a firmware update that will raise that max frame rate to 120 frames per second when shooting in 4K. This is an important fact because if I'm in a run and gun situation and I wanna get some slow motion shots, I will have to switch my camera frame rate over to 120 frames per second. When they do release the firmware update for the ZV-E1 with the 4K 120, it will have a 10% crop. And if it's anything like the FX30, it will lose that active stabilization feature. My FX30 can shoot in 4K 120. However, it is an APS-C camera that gives you an extra 1.5 times crop and then another 1.6 crop when shooting in 4K 120 which totals to be about three times crop. This becomes a problem because with all that crop, you lose image quality and a lot more noise in the shadow areas. To me, it almost makes me stay at 4K 60 when I'm on the FX30, which produces no crop at all, and I can still use active stabilization. So when it comes to usability, frame rates, and resolution, I'm gonna give it to the ZV-E1. Sony recently released a firmware update for the FX30, which truly makes it more of a cinema line camera than the ZV-E1. Things like being able to shoot in 4K DCI and anamorphic D-squeeze for anamorphic lenses are huge upgrades for the FX30. I used to have to record externally when shooting anamorphic on the FX30, and then I would have to de-squeeze the image in my Atomos Ninja 5 just so I could make sure that I'm monitoring the image properly. And in some instances, I didn't want that extra luggage on the FX30. I wanted it to be more sleek design, but I didn't have the option. Now I do. If I wanted to use an anamorphic lens with the ZV-E1, I would have to attach a Ninja 5 to the top and de-squeeze the image from within the monitor just to see what the image looks like and then de-squeeze the image once I got to post. If you do shoot anamorphic, the FX30 is the way to go. Unfortunately, you can't get to that anamorphic de-squeeze through a shortcut in the menu system, so you always have to dive into the deep menu system on the FX30 to get there. But it is better than nothing, which is what the ZV-1 has when it comes to anamorphic de-squeezing, nothing. If you do wanna purchase an anamorphic lens for your FX30, make sure the squeeze factors on the lens is either 1.3 times or 2.0 times because that's the only option Sony gives you within the menu system of the FX30. We talked about resolution on both cameras, but when you switch over to 4K DCI on the FX30, you get a tad bit more pixels on the outside, so you're able to shoot in 4096 by 2160, rather than just the normal 4K, which is 3840 by 2160. The broader resolution of 4K DCI won't give you any more vertical room, but it will give you some more room to work with on the outsides of the frame. However, you can only shoot up to 60 frames per second in 4K DCI, which to me is not worth the trade-off. Not to mention my computer cannot handle 422 10-bit without creating proxies, but if it did, you better believe I'd be filming in that codec. Speaking of codecs, both cameras shoot in all eye, which means you can get an excellent image. And they also have H.265, also known as the HS codec, for smaller file sizes without losing much of that image quality. I personally set my camera up to XAVC HS 4K and shoot in 420 10-bit. When we're comparing two very capable cameras like this, I find that no matter what the camera's advertised dynamic range is, it's the lens on the front of the camera that matters and the person behind it that really helps make a difference. So don't get too hung up on these little details. Instead, I would suggest practicing more, getting out there and just shooting with it and understanding the principles of light and exposing your camera correctly. This leads me to the next real world question for you. What if the display is not sharp enough to nail focus? The LCD screen on the ZV-E1 is 1.04 million dots and the FX30 has 2.36 million dots. I know the popular view on this is it doesn't really matter, but to me it does. If you're not hooked up to an external monitor and you have to use focus speaking on your screen when you wanna ensure that you're nailing focus, it makes it more difficult to see, especially in high key environments, if your displays are not sharp enough. I've come home before to something being out of focus just enough to tick me off, so the LCD screen is important to me, and in this case, the FX30 comes out on top. Although both screens are touchscreen, I try not to touch the screen at all because finger oils will grease up the screen, making it that much tougher to see in sunny environments. You can adjust the exposure settings in the home screen of the ZV-E1, something that you can't do with the FX30, but you, you can use the touchscreen on both menu systems for both cameras. These cameras do not have electronic viewfinders, so we can only rely on the screen when we're out in the field shooting if we don't have an external monitor. So that leads me to the next topic, and that's the buttons on the outside of the cameras. 
to me, the more buttons you have, the better, because the more buttons you have, the more customization you can do, which in turn will make you more efficient and faster when you're out in the field. Clearly, the FX30 wins when it comes to more dials and buttons, along with more quarter mount threads to add accessories to the outside. But just because there are more mounting points doesn't mean you shouldn't purchase a cage. The first accessory that I always purchase for my cameras is a cage. And not only to help me build out the camera a bit more to add some accessories, but to give the camera a better grip and protection in case I drop it. So although the FX30 has more mounting points, I don't consider that to be a huge deal breaker if you're building out a rig because I would recommend just picking up a cage anyways for both cameras. Both cameras do have USB-C, HDMI, headphone, and audio ports. But the ZV-E1 only has a micro HDMI port, whereas the FX30 has a full-size HDMI. This is a huge advantage for the FX30 because I've had to use the small HDMI port on my a7 III, which is my B cam in this video, and it started to become loose over a couple years worth of using it. And I've never had any issues with the large HDMI port, which is on my A cam right now, the a7S III. So the very fact that the FX30 has a full-size HDMI port is huge to me. Also, the hot shoe on the ZV-1 is off to the side a little bit, so if you wanted a top handle and you didn't have a cage, that may pose a lopsided problem for you, whereas the hot shoe that's on the FX30 is right in the middle, which will give you center gravity and excellent balance. The ZV-E1 has way better stabilization because it is full frame and has a dynamic stabilization feature. The FX30 only has active stabilization and because of its 1.5 times crop, your images will not be as smooth depending on whatever lens you're using. A wider lens will produce smoother footage when shooting handheld on either of these cameras. The ZV-E1's dynamic stabilization does produce a good size crop, so I would recommend picking up a gimbal for both cameras if it's in your budget. When it comes to handheld shooting though, I would go with the ZV-E1 for sure. Both cameras do have rolling shutter due to their electronic shutter, which is especially noticeable when you're shooting with longer lenses. If you're shooting with the zoom lens, I highly recommend you pick up a monopod like the YC Onion Panetta to stabilize your rolling shutter. Even though the gyro data in both cameras can fix the rolling shutter in Catalyst Browse, remember that this creates an extra step that you'll have to take in post-production. With that said, the full frame ZV-E1 will have better rolling shutter performance than the FX30, mainly due to the fact that it has a faster sensor readout. The advertised recording limit for the ZV-E1 is unlimited, and Sony's website has a list of recording limits with different codecs and frame rates for the FX30. This would be important to those of you who plan on doing longer shoots, but remember that the recording times may be the least of your problems because of the body heats that the cameras will produce, especially when shooting in 4K60. And when it comes to overheating, the smaller body size of the ZV-E1, which does not have an internal fan, has an unpopular reputation of overheating, especially in warmer climates. It didn't overheat for me while I had it. I mean, I was just shooting outside. It wasn't that hot out and I wasn't doing anything like continuously recording. I just shot a bunch of shorter clips, 20 to 30 second long B-roll type shots. And the FX30 has a bigger body and internal fan, so the likelihood of it overheating would be far less than the ZV-E1. The ZV-E1 has a dual native ISO of 640 and 12,800 in S-Log3, which means the ISO where the camera performs at its optimum level to get the most dynamic range, and the FX30's dual base ISO is 800 and 2500. When it comes to photography, the ZV-E1 can shoot in 12 megapixel bursts up to 10 frames per second, whereas the FX30 can shoot 26 megapixel images but can only shoot one frame per second. Depending on what you're shooting, this is something that you would want to consider, especially if you're a hybrid shooter, because most of the photographers that I've talked to prefer to have cameras that have set bursts between three to 10 bursts per second to ensure they're getting the right shot. But I like the idea of using cameras that only let you shoot one frame per second, because then it makes sure that your frame is right. When it comes to lenses, the ZV-E1's full frame sensor will require full frame lenses, which are a lot more expensive than APS-C lenses. So if you're on a budget, I would go with the FX30 because you'll be able to afford more lenses rather than just getting some crazy expensive lenses just to put on the full frame lens. Although the image quality of a full frame lens paired with a full frame sensor will be a lot better in low light than if you were to use an APS-C sensor camera and an APS-C lens. 
but the ZV-E1 does have a crop mode, but you can only use it in 1080. You can always upscale in post-production to 4K if that's something that you wanna do. And if you already have full frame lenses, you can use it on the FX30 because you can use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras. And you can use APS-C lenses on full frame cameras as long as it has a crop mode. Unfortunately, the ZV-E1 does not have a crop mode. Maybe that firmware update will provide that. The ZV-E1 cannot export RAW, whereas the FX30 can export in 16-bit linear RAW. And I know people have tried to debunk this and say it's really just 12-bit linear RAW, ProRes RAW, or something along those lines. But the bottom line is that you can export RAW footage from the FX30 onto something like an external monitor like the Atomos Ninja 5. Both cameras have the same exact picture profiles. The ZV-E1 has S-Log3 and S-Cine Tone, but the FX30 has Cine AI mode and flexible ISO. The ZV-E1 is dust and moisture resistant, and you can look at the body and see that this mic on the top, if you even get a little bit of water in there, you're gonna be having some issues. Whereas the FX30 is fully weather sealed, I still wouldn't take it out in the rain, but if it's drizzling or if it's snowing a little bit, I wouldn't have any problems taking this thing out. With that being said, because the microphone is on the top, the native audio out of the ZV-E1 will be a lot better than the FX30. The ZV-E1 also has a new feature where it automatically figures out where the audio is coming from, whether it's the front or the back, whereas the FX30 is just old school because it's more of a monitoring native mic. The ZV-E1 has the same exact autofocus as the A7R5, which means you can focus on people, animals, birds, insects, cars, trains, and airplanes, whereas the FX30 only has humans, animals, and birds available. This is important for those of you who wanna do wildlife photography, or you wanna take portraits, or you wanna use your camera as a hybrid camera, then I would go with the ZV-E1. The ZV-E1 also has AI tracking, which crops in and follows you as if it's the cameraman and keeps your framing the same. I don't know if I would ever use this in a real world situation, short of just vlogging or making YouTube videos, but something to consider and the FX30 does not have that. The framing stabilizer is also kind of neat. It's a little feature that will continually keep your subject in frame. I find this to be helpful when you're out and you don't have a gimbal and you just want to help stabilize your footage. The FX30 does not have that. The ZV-E1 only has one SD card slot, which will make it difficult if you're hoping to go shoot some professional work and you wanna have a backup memory card recording for that redundancy factor. You can always buy an Atomos Ninja 5 with some media and record as a secondary for your redundancy, but that would put you back an extra $700 when you think about the actual monitor itself and the media that you have to purchase with it. So unfortunately, because the ZV-E1 only has one slot and the FX30 has two slots, I'm gonna give that one to the FX30. The two slots that are on the FX30 can also accept CF Express cards, so there's a lot more room for professional work with the FX30. The ZV-E1 does have product showcase mode, which we talked about in the beginning of the video. If you're one who likes to record videos and put a product in front of the camera and not have to block your face in order for the camera to pick up what's in front so it doesn't stay locked on your face, then the ZV-E1 is the way to go. The ZV-E1 has a new and easier way to navigate time-lapse. Unlike what we get with other Sony cameras like the FX30 where you'd have to go to interval shooting mode or S&Q, where it literally would take photos and then you would have to take all of those photos together and then in post-production seam them together and then export your video. Whereas the ZV-E1 will actually make the time-lapse file for you and export a 4K video file in 10-bit S-Log with no post-production work necessary other than just color grading it. The ZV-E1 also has Intelligent Auto, which identifies the scene's characteristics and shoots a movie based on whatever the camera's exposure is doing, whereas the FX30 only has Intelligent Auto when we're shooting pictures. If you are shooting in auto exposure, then the ZV-E1 would be the way to go. Also, with people who like letting the camera do most of the work on the front end, rather than post-production, then the ZV-E1 is your camera, especially because it has something called CineVlog where you can quickly shoot cinematic images. And from the description of Sony, when cinematic vlog set is set to on, it adds black bars to the top and to the bottom of the image, and the frame rate is locked to 24 frames per second. There's also several looks and styles that you can choose from so that you can focus on your story. Now, I have not used the CineVlog set on the ZV-E1 Mark II or the ZV-E1, but I'm thinking about making a little video and seeing 
what I can produce as far as maybe a cinematic movie with only using Cinevlog set. Let me know if that's something that you wanna see. If you're a live streamer, you can stream in 4K30 on the ZDE1 and 4K15 on the FX30. However, if you're planning on streaming in 4K for a long time with the ZDE1, it will probably overheat, so I would just pull it back to 1080. The FX30 has time code in, which really only would be used if you were on set and you need to make sure that you're synced up with whatever cameras that are filming to ensure everything is lines up in post. The ZVE1 does not have that. So my conclusion is you have to ask yourself, what are you planning on shooting? You can clearly cross over both cameras for different uses. You can use the FX30 as a vlog camera, but it'll be a bit harder with that crop factor. And you can certainly use the ZVE1 in professional circles with that concern that it may overheat and you will have to have a backup camera or record externally. If you plan on making talking head YouTube videos or vlogging, then I would go with the ZVE1. If you plan on storytelling and making documentaries or making high-end commercials for professional clients, then I would go with the FX30 and some nice lenses to pair up with it. Remember that if you're on a budget, you'll wanna go with the FX30 because the lens options will be so much more vast than what you would get with the ZVE1. Mic ACAM that I'm using right now is the full frame A7S III paired with the 35 millimeter F1.4 Zeiss lens. And because the A7S III and the ZVE1 have the same exact sensor, this is the image that you would have gotten out if I was using the ZVE1 for the shoot. But it may have overheated. Sony gave the ZVE1 some crazy good and new features and to keep that price down, they put a smaller body on it compared to what I have with the A7S III. Are some of these features gimmicky? Would a professional user use something like auto framing and dynamic stabilized footage on the ZVE1? I don't think so because I believe the difference between someone who is doing pro work and amateur work is the pro wants to be in complete control. There's also a feature on the ZVE1 where the aperture stops down automatically if someone else enters the frame. But I like to be in complete control of my camera and I don't want my aperture going crazy if that's not what I wanted it to do. No matter which camera you go with, they will both help tell your story, whatever that might be. I'm Joe with the Film Alliance. I hope this video helped you. And if it did, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and talk to you on the next one.